Now we have studied already where Abraham's wife Sarah has died. And as we get into chapter 25, we find Abraham taking another wife. Now oh, Abraham was 140 years old at this time. And in Genesis chapter 25, beginning with verse 1, the Bible says Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan begot Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Asherim, Ledashim, and Leumim. Now, most of these tribes here are unknown tribes, most likely uh, Arabian tribes, but there's really no way that we uh, know uh, at this time where they uh, were located, other than the fact that they were probably Arabian tribes and they were located in, in the area of Arabia. The uh, uh, interesting thing is that we do know the Midian uh, Midianites, because they appear several times throughout Scripture, so the Midianites are a known tribe. The rest of those tribes are not known tribes. In verse 5, it says, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. Now, the concubines would have been uh, Hagar and Keturah. The reason they would be called concubines is because in the sight of Abraham, he really only had one wife. Sarah was his blessed wife. Sarah was his precious wife. But um, in reference to Keturah and Hagar, they would be referred to as concubines. And I want you to note that Abraham gave everything that he had to Isaac, but he didn't forget the other children. And this is a picture of God's common grace. You know, Jesus made a statement that God causes his sun to shine on the just and the unjust alike. He also causes his rain to fall on the fields of the just and the unjust alike. That's God's common grace. And this is a picture of common grace in that God um, gives to all men because the nature of God is to be a blessing in loving God. Even so, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac but didn't forget the sons of the concubines and he made sure that they were provided for. It says, while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from Isaac his son, to the country of the east. So he got them away from his precious son Isaac, and he sent them off to the east. This is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, uh, 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age an old man, and full of years, and was gathered to his people, which is a uh, Hebraic way of saying he, he died and was buried. Now, in verse 9, it says, His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, in the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried and Sarah his wife. Now, earlier we had noted that uh, Ishmael was sent away. Now it appears at the death of Ishmael's father, Abraham, he comes back, and it appears that he has reconciled with his brother Isaac. Now, Ishmael's 90 years old at this time, and Isaac is 75 when his father died. It came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt in a place called Bir Lahai Roy, which was originally Hagar's well, where she had uh, gotten into contention with uh, Sarah, and Sarah had uh, driven her away. She had run away, and she had uh, uh, an angel of the Lord appeared to her at this particular place in uh, Bir Lahai Roy, and that's where we, we see Isaac dwelling, and that's where Isaac was when he uh, encountered his wife, and this is the place that they're living at, Bir Lahai Roy. Now, this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. These were the names of the sons of Ishmael by, by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael was Nebajoth, then Kedar, Abdil, Ab Adbil, Nibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadar, Tema, Jader, Nafish, and Kedima. Now, naturally, if somebody from the east were to hear me say that, they'd laugh at the way I'm pronouncing those names. It always appears like I know how to pronounce these names. I haven't the foggiest idea <laughs> how to pronounce these names. 
but that's what they look like. <laughs> these were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names by their towns and their settlements, 12 princes according to the nations. Remember that God had blessed Hagar and told her that Ishmael would be a father of nations, and these uh, sons of his represent that blessing that God fulfilled. These were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, as you go toward Assyria, which is northern Arabia, and he died in the presence of all his brethren. This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban the Syrian. Now, Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah his wife conceived. Now, you know, Isaac knew that he was in the line of blessing, that God had promised that he would bless Abraham, and God had promised to bless him. And he's waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. He's waiting in order to have a child, but his wife is barren. She's not having a child. And God had promised that he would fulfill his promises, and it's causing him a little concern. So he begins to pray and seek the Lord and say, God, you need to uh, give me a child. I'd like a child. And so the Lord heard his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, this is the kind of verse, and these are the kinds of verses that are interesting, and they're recommended underlining types of verses. Let me, let me share why. We live in a time when children in the womb are called products of conception. They're called fetuses. They're promoted as being non-human, which gives reason for abortion to be so easily acquired. You see, they're not viable, actual human beings, according to those who would promote abortion as being a woman's choice. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that these little guys are fighting already in the womb. And uh, the Bible speaks about them as being individuals who are going to be great nations. Unfortunately, we have allowed the, what I would consider, blasphemously ignorant individuals to sell us on a concept of human life that is non-biblical and is really from the pit. And when we allow people to convince us that a woman's right for her body is to supersede the rights of the life within the womb, then we've missed the point of God's beautiful creation and the individuality of every person under God's established order. We have violated God's command when he said you should not murder. I consider abortion to be murder. I also understand that sometimes under the influence of ungodly counselors and out of fear and lack of wisdom, we make mistakes. And many women have made that mistake. Therefore, we don't condemn people for making decisions that were not well-founded, well thought out, or well understood. But we need to look at life the way God sees it, so that the Word of God is here for us, to teach us what he considers to be reality, what's life. God's Word tells us. Those little children within the womb are human beings with personalities. They move, they, it appears here that they also fight, and they've got personalities. And it's a sad thing to realize that we have allowed them to be mass murdered in the name of personal freedom. Do you know that originally when abortion was being pushed, the reason abortion was being pushed was, uh, what the, the argument went, well, what about those who have been raped 
or in cases of incest. Now that was the argument originally, if you can look back and remember it, because it hasn't been that long. That was the argument. That was the strength of the argument. That's what people said. And so it caused you to think, well, that's a very ethically confusing question. So we said, well, in those particular cases, being hard choices, we can understand that. Do you know that before the decision in the Supreme Court, the Wade versus Roe decision, before that decision was made, there were 63,000 abortions in the United States. After, it is now 1.5 million. Now, we also know that the majority of those abortions are abortions out of convenience. Do you know that there are women who look at an abortion as a rite of passage now? Do you know that there are women who have abortions who get pregnant to see whether they can have babies, to see whether they're fertile or not, and then have abortions? It's true, it was in the Village Voice out of New York, a newspaper account where a, a feminist wrote that. There are women who have abortions to add to their ability to say, I've had a hard life, I've had an abortion. It's an incredible thing that's happening right now. The church has gotten sidetracked. So what is taking place now? People no longer are arguing for the cases of incest. Now it's a woman's right to choose. And the humanist has forgotten to follow the logic of his own argument and has thrown away his argument. The original argument being incest and rape. No longer is holding water, it's no longer valid. Now it's a woman's right to choose. What's it going to be next time? What's it going to be? This is why the church needs to stand solid and sure and secure in our positions. Those little babies feel it when that saline is injected. They are born and actually stuffed into linen closets alive. There are 400 minimal live births through saline abortions and prostaglandin abortions per year. That means that once a day there's a baby stuffed in a linen closet or left in a basin to die once a day minimally. That's what we know. Do you know there's a conspiracy of silence in hospitals where the nurses will not stand up and even say anything, but they're going insane? What do you think it would be like to pick up a baby scalded by saline and not be able to do anything for it and to have the doctor say, it'll die, just leave it alone, and 12 hours later come and find that little thing whimpering and crying in a basin, knowing it's alive and knowing that it's going to survive. But the doctor is given the uh, ability to make a medical decision, and he tells you what life is. This is what is wrong with the church when we remain silent on issues. Babies are alive, we know that. We know that when you're pregnant and you want it, you call it your baby. And when you don't want it, you just say, I'm pregnant. Or I've got to feed it. That's a euphemism. That changes the reality of the life into a product of conception. And eventually, in France, they can use babies for cold cream on women's faces. They take out of the baby something called collagen, and they put it on their skin, and they wear it on their faces. And that's what takes place when they wipe out these babies. It's incredible, isn't it? So, what does God say about human life in the womb? God says it's human life in that womb. It's alive, it feels, it even struggles. And you see that taking place with Jacob and Esau. God said, there are two nations in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger, which demonstrates God's sovereign choosing. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red. Now, most babies come out red. You know, every one of mine did. They're all red and chalky. But this one appears to have been a little more red than usual, so he was, she was like a hairy garment, like a little ball of fur, a little hairball. <laughs> so they named him Esau, which is Harry. Harry. So next time you meet somebody named Harry, just laugh. <laughs> now afterward, his brother came out, and 
His hand took hold of Esau's heel. So he was called Jacob, which is heel catcher or supplanter or sneaky. Now, isn't that interesting? These little guys are still going at it. The baby's being born, and, the, and this other one's still grabbing at his feet, you know, when he's being born. And there comes this little hand out of the womb, just trying to get him just before mom holds him, you know. <laughs> kind of shows you the personality of this, uh, this little boy named Jacob, doesn't it? It shows you his personality. You know, we are born with personalities. For the longest time, I was an environment, uh, environmental, I was into environmental conditioning. I believe that you become what you're programmed to become. That's what I used to teach and that's what I used to believe until I had children. My David the other day, you see, I told this to the Bible study the other day, when I was a little boy and I'd get mad, I'd hit my head on the wall to punish my mom, you know? And my mom would say, go to your room, and all of a sudden I'd be bashing my head on the wall, you know? And my brother would bash his head and we'd just sit there hitting our heads on the wall. And my mom, you know, would hear this clunking in the room and she'd know that we were punishing her, you see. So she would come in and open the door and look in and say, just don't put a hole in the wall and close the door and leave. And we'd sit there all bruised and we realized it wasn't working. Mom wasn't feeling bad. My David, a couple days ago, got really mad at me. <laughs> Can't believe it. <laughs> and he was on his bunk bed and he starts jumping up and down on the bunk bed, hitting his head on the ceiling. And I'm looking at him and I said, just don't put a hole in the ceiling. And I closed the door and walked out. I said, I can't believe it. Now, I don't do that anymore. He must have got it from his mother. <laughs> they do things, and you see yourself in your children, and you say, oh, you know, that's what makes you worry. You say, oh, God, don't let them be like me. So you see the personalities from birth. This little guy was a fighter. He, was a, he would hold on. He wasn't going to let go. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter. Now, there was really no need for him to be a skillful hunter, incidentally. This is something he liked to do. He was a cunning hunter. He didn't need to hunt for food. They had plenty of it, but he liked it. He was a man's man, quote, unquote. He was the kind of guy who liked to go out into the field and sweat and smell and hunt. But Jacob was a mild man, and he liked to be around Mama, dwelling in tents. So Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Sibling rivalry, preference of children. And yet at the same time, you see God's call. You see God's call. Now, Esau was what we would consider a man's man. He was a guy who liked to get up early and go out and shoot an animal and drag it back and open it up pull it its intestines, and he was gross. Now me, <laughs> I would have been in the house, vacuuming. <laughs> I'm just not into killing animals. But his dad liked him. He liked him because he was, uh, he was uh, the kind of kid that was handy to have around. He was a wild man out there, and he'd go out hunting, and he was, his dad loved to eat the food that he would make. But the guy was irresponsible. Jacob cooked a stew. See, it shows that this guy liked to put her around the house. You know, he's in there cooking a stew. And Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. He was dirty and smelly, and he'd been chasing deer all around. He's hungry. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I'm weary. Now, doesn't that sound polite? Doesn't that sound nice? See, and that's not what he said. That's not the literal Hebrew. It's interesting when you get the literal Hebrew, he said, let me gulp down that red stuff. That's what he said. I want to just scarf up, man. That's what he was like. That's what he walked in saying. You know, I can picture this guy wiping his mouth, walking in just stinking and saying, give me some of that, man. It looks good. Well, you know, his brother's here with his little pot, just cooking with a little apron on. <laughs> So he says, give me some of that red stuff, man. I'm hungry, and I'm tired. Therefore, his name was called Edom, which is red. But Jacob said, oh, now here's the cunning of Jacob, man. This guy's been fighting from the womb, and he hasn't given up yet. Jacob said, well, sell me your birthright as of this day. I'll give it to you, but all I want is the primary blessing, and I want to be the head of the family. That's a minor thing to ask for. You know, a, a man who had the birthright had a double portion of all that the father had. Double portion. 
Not only that, he would have the right to lead the clan. It was a heavy thing to give up for some stew. But what is the answer here? Esau said, look, I'm about to die. What's the profit of this birthright anyway? You know, what good will it do me if I'm going to die right now? So Jacob said, well, swear to me. Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Now, can you imagine that? That's the character differences. Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, and he ate and drank a rose and went his way. And in this manner, Esau despised his birthright. Man, <laughs> we, can, we could preach 52 sermons on how come, how, how come we are willing to take such cheap gifts and allow ourselves to be ripped off, as Christians even, from God's blessings. The world is interesting because when you're in the world and you're not seeking the Lord, it really doesn't take a lot to satisfy you. It just has to be a little bit more than you have right now. You know, when I was growing up, if you made, I can remember, man, waiting for the day that I'd make $100 a week. When I make $100 a week, I'm making big money. I'm rolling in the bucks. And I remember finally having $100 and then finding out that inflation had worn that $100 away to hardly anything. So I needed to make two. Then you need three. Then you need four. Do you remember when a house could be sold for $12,000? You know, my parents bought theirs for $9,000. You know, my father-in-law pays $74 a month for his house. He's got a half acre in Chino. $74 a month. Now what? You go out and buy a little cottage, it costs you $100,000. So we are constantly chasing bubbles, things that explode once we get our hands on them. And we will despise our birthright for a bowl of stew. And people are willing to lie as Christians in business if they get more money. Do you know that some of the worst service I've ever had is from Christian business people? I regret to say that. I regret that with every beat of my heart because I go out of my way to give my business to Christians. But the reality of the situation is this. Christians very often are undisciplined and don't give good service. And all I've gotten is excuse after excuse after excuse for them not giving me good service and not coming in to service that product they gave to me. That's unfortunate, but it's true. The integrity level's incredible. And they're selling out their integrity for pottage for the car that they're driving, for their house that they're living in, for the clothes that they're wearing on their back. We despise our birthrights. We sell them cheaply. Our integrity is nil. We think that God won't bless us if we're honest, so we lie like the rest of the world in order to get that extra buck or maybe that title. That's important to us, but it doesn't mean anything in the kingdom of God. And Esau surely was a man that we are modeling ourselves after when we live that kind of life. So he despised his birthright. There was a famine in the land. Now this is where we're going to look at the character of Isaac. There was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. That first famine that he's referring to had occurred about 100 years earlier when Abraham had gone on down to Egypt. Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Now Gerar is the capital of Philistine country. Abimelech is not necessarily a name of a king, though. It's not the same king, Abimelech, that you heard of earlier when uh, Abraham had dealt with him. Abimelech is like Pharaoh. It's a title of the king, okay? So he went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. In other words, don't backtrack and lose ground in your walk with me. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. So God has given his blessing to Isaac here. I will be with you and bless you, for to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. So he's bequeathing on him that blessing that he had given to his father Abraham. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked him about his wife. And that sounds familiar now, doesn't it? That's exactly what happened with his daddy. 
So the men of the place asked him about his wife, and he said, she's my sister. I wonder where he learned that from. Our children learn our bad habits quicker than they learn our good ones. She's my sister. For he was afraid to say, she's my wife. Now, God had just appeared to him, promised him, blessed him. God, you know, when God appears to you, uh, you know, I don't know anybody in this room uh, that could probably say, well, God has appeared to me. You know, that's just not a common thing. But you would assume when God appears to you, that would leave an impression in your life that you'd never forget. <laughs> you know, the dread of the Lord is in this place. And you would, you, would, you would think, my goodness, you know, that must have altered his character. And this shows you that that does not alter your character. It doesn't. Because no, no sooner had God said, I'm going to bless you, than he's lying. The carnality of his nature is exposed. He's lying. He's afraid that they're going to rip off on his, on his wife. Rebecca was a beautiful woman. She's beautiful to behold, he said. Now it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw, and there was Isaac sporting in the King James, you know, playing touch football, right? I mean, that's the first time I read sporting, I thought they must have been running track or something. I didn't, that means showing endearment, caressing his wife as a husband would caress his wife. It is quite obvious, in other words, that they were not sister and brother. Abimelech's looking out the window and there's Isaac loving his wife right in front of him. And so Abimelech calls Isaac and he says, well, quite obviously she's your wife. So how could you say she's my sister? And Isaac said to him, because I said, lest I die on account of her. Lest I die on account of her. No, the Bible says that we're to love our wives even as Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Do you know that he took the chance that a man would sleep with his wife just to preserve his skin? And yet the Bible teaches us that we're to love our wives enough to lay down our lives for them. I certainly would not call my wife my sister and take the chance that a man would sleep with my wife. But this man here, he's got a lot of learning to do about what it means to be a man. And he's not a man yet. He's going to learn, though, as we look through this man's life. He's going to learn. He's going to come up to a man who's going to teach him some things pretty soon. He said, lest I die in a counter, I don't want to die for my wife. Abimelech said, well, what is this you have done to us? It's not just you, and it's not just your skin. Man, you could have brought a curse on us. What have you done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. This is the grace and mercy of God, because he could have rightly done a job on him for that, but he didn't. Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him, because God was keeping his promise. You see, God will give you promises. This is interesting how the Lord works. He will give you promises that it is impossible for you to fathom. I can't understand the blessings of God. I don't understand them. When you talk to me about heaven, you might as well talk to me about the man on the moon. I don't understand heaven. I haven't even the foggiest conception of it. But through my life, I've seen God's blessing in areas that have become realities. And I'm deepening in my faith. And I'm understanding things about God now that I didn't understand 10, 13 years ago. But God will tell you, I'm going to give you this incredible thing, and you just sit back because you can't even imagine what it is. Then he draws you step by step towards that promise, and it becomes a reality. And your mind starts focusing on the goodness and the awesome character of God, the reality that he does bless. And before you know it, you've been maturing in the Lord, and you see more of his character, you see more of the way he is, and you've matured. But you see, trying to tell me about heaven and getting me to understand that is like trying to tell a child who grew up in the ghetto about the joy of going to Disneyland. Because a child growing up in the ghetto doesn't know what Disneyland's all about. Somebody might tell them about it. You know, when I worked in the barrio in East Los Angeles, we took the little kids out of there one time to a park in La Mirada. They had, some of them had never even been out of the barrio, never. And we put them in these buses and we put them on the freeway and we drove out through La Habra and La Mirada area and they looked outside and they saw cows for the first time. They'd never seen a cow. 
and they saw cows, and it touched you. So my goodness, you know, I've seen so many cows, I can't stand them. <laughs> These little guys have never even seen one. When you get your, your little kids, when my kids, we used to drive out sometimes on Sunday, Sunday uh, afternoons, we drive in Chino by the, the, the dairies, and my babies, when they were growing up, would want to touch the cow. Because they didn't have, they'd see maybe a picture of a cow, but never seen it. And it's, a, it's the reality becoming concrete to them when you bring them next to a cow, and they see how big it is and how stinky that thing is, and all that stuff. <laughs> and they say, that's where milk comes from. I don't want milk ever again, you know. <laughs> so God teaches us first by telling us what he wants to do, then maturing us to be enabled to understand it. So that's how God's going to work with him. God said, I'm going to bless you, but he still doesn't know, and that's why he's able to lie and able to be carnal. The man began to prosper, continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great number of servants, and so the Philistines envied him. Anytime you have material goods, there's somebody who wants them. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said, Isaac, go away from us, for you're much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there, which is a northeast journey from where he was at that time. Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham, excuse me, wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them, and Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water, or an, a living spring, an artesian well. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herds and saying, this water's ours. In other words, they're progressively pushing them away. So he called the name of the well Esek because they quarreled with him as a well of contention. Then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna, which is enmity. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, which is the well of ample room. Because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the Lord, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord and worshiped God literally. And he pitched his tent there and their Isaac's servants dug a well. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar and Nahusoth, one of his friends, and Phicol. Phicol was a title also, probably a commander's title, like a general of some sort. And Phicol, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to him, Why have you come to see me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? But they said, We have certainly seen that the Lord's with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now blessed of the Lord. So the enemy saw, the people who hated him saw that God blessed them, and this was ample proof to these heathens that their God, the God that uh, he was serving, was a blessing God. You see, God in the Old Testament, as you go through it, needed to reveal portions of his character to man. Man didn't know what God was like. Now, as New Testament believers, we know God blesses, because we can look in the Old Testament and see that. But what if you were not raised with any kind of, of, of testimony as to the character of God? God has to show you step by step the way he is. And that's why God would prosper them. God would prosper them because this is the way that the materialist was able to see the reality of God. Now, that is not the general way that God works in the New Testament. But that was uh, a position in the old that you see that God would bless in that manner. So these people saw it. They say, you are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast and they ate and drank. Then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another and Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. It came to pass the same day that Isaac's servant came, servants came and d told him about the well which they dug and said to him, we found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. When Esau was 40 years old, which makes Isaac about 100, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and Bezmath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. And they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. In her marriage, once again, you remember Abraham when he said, when you go and get my son Isaac a wife, 
Do not take her from one of the Canaanites. Go to my people and get for him a wife from them. Well, here is Esau, a man 40 years of age, desiring to be married, and he not only marries Canaanites who are, who are ungodly, but he married two of them on top of that. Polygamy. I want you to note that polygamy never is in the scriptures recognized as being God's law. It is always the result of carnality. It is not God's intention for man to have more than one wife because I believe that it's impossible for us to really develop the kind of relationships that God wants us to have if we have more than one wife. It's hard enough for us to learn to serve one, let alone learn to serve two or more. And there's nothing but contention. You see that throughout the scriptures when there's more than one wife. There's jealousy, there's envy, there's strife. It just doesn't work. And God never intended it. He also never intended us to intermarry with people who have no faith in the Lord because it just destroys. And therefore, if you're single and not married and looking towards marriage, make sure that you don't disregard the command of the Lord. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he couldn't see, that he called Esau, his oldest son, and said to him, My son. And he answered him, Here I am, Here I am Dad. You know. Now Isaac's 135 years old now, and I want you to see what kind of man Isaac is. He's an incredible guy. He's had a pretty blessed life. He's 135 years old, but he appears to me to be either very dramatic or a hypochondriac, and I'm not quite sure which. I lean towards the drama, though. He's 135, his eyes were so dim that he couldn't see, and he called Esau his oldest son, Esau being 75, and he said to him, my son, he answered, here I am. He said, behold, now I am old, I do not know the day of my death. Now, he died when he was 180 years old. <laughs> That's why I say he must have been a very dramatic man. I don't know when I'm going to die. 45 years later, he's going to die. <laughs> now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. And I picture this little old man laying down on his bed, begging his little boy to go out and kill something for him. So I might bless you. He is disregarding God's statement he had made 75 years earlier when he said, the older shall serve the younger. Disregarding it totally. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you that blessing that you're that I want to give you, even though he had despised his birthright and had sold it for a bowl of stew. Now here we go with Rebecca. She seems very much like Sarah. Now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. You remember Sarah hiding in the tent, listening into the conversation? Well, Rebecca is there listening into the conversation of uh, the father and the son here, and she she heard uh, she heard what was said. And uh, Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I've heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I'll make savory food from them for your father such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. Now, this is a way of fulfilling a promise through the flesh. She's going to attempt to keep the promise of God to bless her son, the secondborn. She's going to attempt to, to make, through deceit, him receive the blessing. Now, wouldn't it have been nicer had she and her husband discussed this and prayed about it? Perhaps the deceit wouldn't have had to have happened, huh? But you see how we are. We, we circumvent God and we ignore each other and we go about getting God's will to be done in carnal ways. And as a result of that, we create tremendous problems for ourselves from that point on. Now, it would have worked a lot better had she walked into her husband and said, Honey, you know I love you. But you also remember 75 years ago what God said. And though you love to eat the food that your son brings you, and though you love him with every beat of your heart, God has determined to bless the younger. 
And with that firm and loving rebuke, he could have given himself over to the Lord. But watch the deceit as it unfolds. You know, this guy just liked to eat. He couldn't tell the difference between venison and a, a goat. He doesn't know the difference. It's just that he liked to eat. He loved to eat. And, you know, but Jesus, go out and kill a couple of goats, man. I'll make them taste so good, he won't even know the difference. And he'll bless you. So Jacob says to Rebecca, now, wait a minute, Mom. Esau, my brother's a hairy man. And I'm smooth-skinned. I don't have hairy arms. I'm not a hairy man. My, my brother is. My brother's like a little bear. But I'm not. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him. And I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. So you see the cunning of his mind. He's thinking it through. It's not that he doesn't want the blessing. He just wants to evaluate the chances. Is it worth the risk? You see, I don't have much hair on my arm, Mom, and if Pop reaches over and grabs me, I'm a, I'm a goner. So she says, don't worry about it. Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. Now, he should have rebuked Mama. He should have said, Mama, you're wrong. Go and talk to Dad about this. You know, the hardest thing to do is to tell your parents they're wrong. But you better love them enough to tell them. You better love them enough to tell them. Because if you don't, nobody else will. He should have rebuked his mom. He should have said, Mom, I love you, and I've respected you, and I've loved to learn how to cook under you, and I've been a good boy all my life. And I can clean a mean tent, Mom. <laughs> but that's wrong. He let her say, if a curse falls on you, I'll take it myself. That shows the cunning of the man. So he thought that was a good idea. He went and he got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory food such as his father loved. And then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went to his father and said, my father, and he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Now, I, I, I believe that he was trying to disguise his voice a little bit. Now, you know, most uh, brothers have a timber in their voice that is very similar. If you, if you ever watch, you know, uh, listen to musicians that are family, and they can harmonize very well because of the timber or their, or their structure in the throat. And very often, brothers like the Everly brothers and different brothers have a harmony that develops because they've learned to speak in the same way. Certain words that your family pronounces in a certain way, you're able to pronounce. The timing's very similar. And your voices sometimes are very similar. And it's hard to distinguish the two. And that's why when you're talking to your mom sometime, and if you have a brother around the same age, sometimes they, will, they won't know for sure who it is talking to them until they hear you speak a little bit longer. Then they know. Then they know who it is. And that's how that is. So I certain, I'm certain he was attempting to disguise his voice a little bit. He's got his brother's clothes on, and he's walked in with this skins on his arm, skins in the back of his neck. He must have looked silly, but his father's blind. What does he know? He brings in this goat stew. So he went to his father and said, My father, he said, Here, I'm, here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Here's his lie. Because the Lord your God brought it to me. Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near, that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. Now, I, at this point, I picture this guy carrying this plate, and it's shaking. You know, he's, oh, no, I'm busted. He's going to put me on restriction. So he comes here to Isaac, his father, and, and he felt him. And he said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He didn't recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. Then he said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Now, I think that at this point, I would be hurting terribly for deceiving my father. 
And I also think that he probably was hurt terribly by his father, for his father loved Esau more than he loved him his whole life. And it probably hurt him to realize that he was second best in his father's sight. His father didn't care about him as much as he loved his brother. And yet, at the same time, he knew that God was going to bless him. He lied in the name of God. He also didn't care whether his mother got a curse or not. But I had a feeling that this was a very sad moment for them, besides just a ripping off of a blessing. The blessing was his. God had promised it. He shouldn't have stolen it. But I think of it as being a very sad time for him because of the rivalry that existed from the womb between him and his brother. He couldn't even receive a blessing the way that it should be given, and that's sad. So his father said, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing. Now this man who liked to play around in the field must have had an interesting odor, huh? His father knew what he smelled like. <laughs> so this man doesn't use right guard. <laughs> he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field. <laughs> which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. You know, that blessing is still binding, incidentally. This is why it's so very important that we as, as Americans should remember the blessing that God gave to Abraham when he said he would bless those who bless you and curse those who cursed you. And I really do believe that part of the reason the United States is existing to this day is that we are one of the only nations in the entire world that have not turned our backs on the Jewish nation. I really believe that God continues his hand of blessing on us as immoral and as prone to judgment as this nation is. I think one of the major reasons God hasn't brought judgment on us is the fact that we haven't yet turned our back on the nation Israel. And that curse is still in effect. Look at the Arab nations. Look what happens when they make war against Israel. The miraculous things that occur. There was a war that took place. I can't remember the exact one. I think it was the Six-Day War. That the Jews, no, Yom Kippur War. That the, the Jews on Yom Kippur do not do a thing. Their militia is off. Everything is dead. Israel is silent. And, the, and, and they were attacked by their neighbors on Yom Kippur. They were caught totally off guard. They even turned their radios off. The radio stations are dead silent. There's radio silence throughout Israel. And they came in, these, the, 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 their, uh, their neighbors came in against them, and it was such an open field that they thought they must be walking into a trap. Their enemies could have overwhelmed them in that single day. But they found themselves with all their tanks out in the middle of Israel with nobody standing up against them, nobody, no jets, no fighting, no tanks, nothing. They thought, we're entering into a trap. And the hesitation that they experienced in the middle of that field was enough time for the Lord to awaken some people to the fact that Israel was being attacked and Israel armed itself and was able to repel the invading forces. It was a miracle. Our guide was telling us about that when we were in Israel last year. He said, we should have been wiped out. We believe it was the hand of God that kept us from being destroyed. God's hand is still in the nation Israel. Look what happens to the nations that come against them. This little, little nation. Then it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also had made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, uh, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? And he said, I'm your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? <laughs> you know, wait a minute, I just blessed somebody. He's, he's still rubbing his tummy. It's still swollen, you know, from eating. He said, Well, where's the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate, up, I ate all of it before you came, and I blessed him. Indeed, he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me. Even me also, oh my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? No, he's a sneak. For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and now look, he even has taken away my blessing. Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed I have made him your master. And all his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I have sustained him. 
What shall I do now for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, my father. Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And there was nothing he could do. He couldn't get it back once he gave it up. Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth, and of the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. It, and it shall come to pass, when you become restless, that you shall break his yoke from your neck. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. In other words, my dad's going to die pretty soon. Then... I will kill my brother Jacob. So he comforted himself with words concerning the murdering of his own brother. And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a few days. A few days turned out to be 20 years. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you've done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be reaved also of you both in one day? Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. So she, she came as a mother-in-law to, uh, to Isaac and said, Man, I can't stand Esau's wives. They're driving me nuts. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? You know, I'm going to die. So Isaac, being a loving husband, called Jacob, blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Paddan Aram, at the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Paddan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take himself a wife from there and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padam Aram. Also Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan didn't please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajah, to be his wife in addition to the wives that he had. So he wanted to please his dad by making this wife number three. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and laid down in that place to sleep. Sounds pretty comfortable, doesn't it? Put your head on top of a rock to sleep. And he dreamed. Now he's by himself now. He's leaving. He's by himself. Then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants also. Your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. I wonder if we ever know that. I wonder if we ever know that, when the Lord's in a place or not. You know, he's laying there, he's asleep, he has this dream, and the first thing he says, Man, God's here. God is here. And I don't think I ever realized that God is where I am, regardless of the circumstance or situation I'm in. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? There is none other than the house. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And I really do believe that there is a, a need in the Christian church for us to realize that when we gather together, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I really do believe that we need to, to uh, teach our children, which is very difficult, 
to have respect and reverence for people who are sitting in church, who are preparing and meditating and getting ready to meet the Lord, and that we don't allow them to run around and cause distraction, especially when someone's preparing their heart to worship. And it's something that we as parents need to be very sensitive to, that we don't disrupt somebody else's time with the Lord by allowing our children to go cuckoo around them. Which, when you have kids, you know, it's, it happens, and you don't think about it. And because we're Protestants, we don't want to create too big of a deal on a building. We are the church physically, and we need to realize that. But at the same time, we meet in buildings as the church. We congregate there, and I think that we need to set a place apart. Uh, uh, a place, we need to set apart places to worship, and we need to remember that, that we need to teach our children reverence. He said he was afraid. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Now, what happened is he had a dream, and in that dream there was a ladder. It's all symbolic. What it represents is God mediating between man. And Jesus said that he was the ladder. He was Jacob's ladder. Jesus referred to himself as the ladder in John chapter 1. He was, in other words, the way that God would reach down and touch man, and that man could commune with God. He was that ladder, and that's what that represented to him. Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on the top of it, and he called the name of the place Bethel, which is the house of God. But the name of that city has been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way, and I am going, uh, a way that I'm going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. The point he was making is, is not that he's making specifically a bargain, but he's saying, seeing that God is blessing me, he is my God. And he will prove himself to be my God as he takes me where I'm going and he brings me back. As a result of him being my God, I'm going to build a house for him. And not only that, but the blessings that he gives to me, I'm going to give back to him gratefully. I'll give him a tenth of everything he gives me. And that's what I'm going to do. Because God loves a cheerful giver. And he's responding cheerfully to that. God gave me this. I'm going to give it back. Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east, which is Mesopotamia. And he looked and saw a well in the field. And behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We're from Haran. Then he said, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. Now these are young kids, incidentally. They talk to. So he said to them, Is he well? And they said, He's well. Look, his daughter Rachel's coming with the sheep. Now at this point, he's remembering that he's supposed to take for himself somebody from his, from his family. And here comes Rachel, which is, uh, he's related to and I'm certain he's getting excited. Wow, this is probably it. God is going to answer that prayer. So he starts hurrying them up. He says, look, it's still high day. In other words, it's early in the day. Get busy. It's, it's time for the cattle be, to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. In other words, get out of here. I want to meet this girl when she gets here, you know? They said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled a stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. They were too small, in other words, to move the stone. We have to wait till there's enough of us to do that. Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled a stone away from the well's mouth. <laughs> you know, I mean, he saw this girl, and he said, I'll get him out of here. You know, I just picture this guy. He sees this fox walking down the street, and he said, that's mine. And he runs up and grabs a stone, throws it out of the way, gets the watering done, gets the kids out of there so he can spend some time with this girl. He watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And that's because she hadn't brushed her teeth yet. <laughs> and that's what you'll do. Neither that or she was wearing braces. The first girl I ever kissed had braces. I'll never forget that kiss. Terrible. <laughs> so he wept. Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him. And uh, 
brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you're my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Jacob is sneaky, but man, he's going to meet somebody who's got his PhD in deceit. See, it's like a novice meeting a master. Laban knows that he's excited over Rachel. Oh, he knows that. I mean, and so he's been watching this guy kind of watching Rachel every time she walks by. And you know Laban's picked it up, and he knows that, that this boy's going to marry his daughter anyway. He also knows that Abraham had been blessed tremendously, and he knows that Isaac had been blessed, and it's a good catch for my Rachel. And he knows that. So he's going to web, he's going to have a web of deceit here. He's going to start weaving. So he asks him to name your own wage. You know, it's an interesting thing. When you tell someone to name their own wage, they're generally more generous uh, for what they'll do for you. In other words, I have a friend of mine who, he, he taught me something about human nature one day. I had some candy, and I said, would you like some? And he said, yes. So I expected him to reach into the bag and take some. Now, when you reach into the bag of candy, you always take just a little bit, because you don't want to appear to be a glutton, right? And then you expect them to say, take more. And then you take more, and you're happy, and that's just the way we do things. He didn't do that. He stuck his hand out, forcing me to be generous, when I didn't want to be generous, because <laughs> I liked the candy. And that's what is taking place here. You say, name your own wage because he knows he'll be generous when he names that. I'll do a lot for, for her. That's what, she's, what he's going to do. You know, I'm going to work seven years for her. Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Now, Leah's eyes were delicate, which means weak. She, she probably squinted when she walked around. You know, She bumped into things. She couldn't see. <laughs> She had weak eyes, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Laban said, oh, <laughs> boy, he just, oh, he made a good deal, and he's trying to keep it inside. You know, oh, it's better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Okay, stay with me. Boy, I can see him jumping up and down. He's so happy. But inside, you know, he's going crazy. Outside, he's real cool. Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed but a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Love is patient. How many times I've had to sit down with people who say, but we've got to get married. I just need to get married. We love each other. How long have you been dating? Three weeks. I think love is patient. Now, I'm certain that God honors love, and, and, and sometimes we put too many restrictions on people and say, well, you need to know each other for 15 years, you know. And that's wrong, too. You know, but I've noticed sometimes, uh, uh, more often than not, to be honest with you, when people want to get married and they want to get married quickly, there's, there, that's a reason to be concerned. Love is patient. Love is patient. And I wonder how many of us would have married our wives had we had to work for them for seven years. <laughs> you know? There would probably be a lower divorce rate if we said, man, I'll work seven years for my wife. See, you work the rest of your life once you get married, you know. But, <laughs> but seven years of preparation. And what's interesting is that he loved her and his love was growing and love is patient. And for seven years, he was working for her. And man, they seemed like just a few days to him. And it was up. But in seven years, he has grown to desire this woman to the point where he's just, oh man, I can hardly wait to marry her. And he's anticipating, you know, when I was in the army, we, we anticipated getting out of the army. We had calendars, and we counted from 100 days down to the day that we get out. And I looked forward to that day that I could get out. And when you had about 10 days, you would run, run around the barracks, and in, in the most opportune time, you would yell, short. And everybody knew that you were about to get out. And they'd get mad and throw things at you, and it was just part of the happiness that you could share with others. <laughs> short. And uh, he was getting short, man, seven years. And finally, the day's coming, and he's anticipating her, but they're just flying by because he's so in love with her. So 
Jacob said to Laban, now notice Laban, I'm certain, knew that the seven years were up, but Jacob, Jacob, Jacob had to come up to him and say, give me my wife. My days are fulfilled that I may go into her. I want to fulfill our vows. I want to be married. Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went in to her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning, and these are the saddest words in the book of Genesis. Behold, it was Leah. <laughs> what a drag, man. <laughs> I mean, he put on the Tarzan act and everything that night for her, you know? I mean, this married night, seven years he'd been waiting to consummate that. Seven years. He'd been waiting to, to just make love to his wife. Now, that's heavy when you realize that. He'd been holding himself back just so that he could be with her. And it turns out that Laban pulled that trick. Man, that would make you pretty mad. It'd make you very mad. And he got real angry. All that desire, all that waiting for nothing, for nothing. Now, that's a PhD in sneakiness that Laban earned. What is this you've done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. No, you've been with us seven years, and I failed to tell you that. I should have, should have let you know. You know, I'm, I'd slipped my mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fulfill her week. And we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. Well, Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, you know, because he loved that woman. So he gave him his daughter, Rachel, his wife also. Laban gave his maid, Bilhah, to his daughter, Rachel, as a maid. Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban still another seven years. How sad for Leah that she didn't have a man who loved her. Do you notice the grace of God in this? Because God is going to allow her to have children, which is a blessing. And as a matter of fact, it appears that Jacob's going to spend quite a bit of time with her because she's going to have four kids very rapidly. And it appears that he spent quite a bit of time with her. Uh, and God, you know, uh, uh, honored uh, Leah with children. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son and... She called his name Reuben. He was a Chicano. <laughs> El Reuben. <laughs> you know, there are a few Mexicans in the Bible. There's Jose. <laughs> You'll see. Reuben. She named him Reuben. For she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction now, Reuben means, behold, a son. The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Isn't that sad? Now he'll love me because I gave him a son. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I'm unloved. He has therefore given me this son also. That means Simeon. His name means hearing. She conceived again and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I've borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi, which means attached. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Judah means praise. And then she stopped bearing. I feel sorry for Leah as I go through the scriptures because she's a woman who didn't deserve to be unloved, and her father contributed to this hard situation, and yet we're going to see God redeeming even something like this.